So this lecture will be recorded so you can always go back. But if you have any questions during the lecture, please let me know. Uh, so my name is Michał Kwas. I'm doing electron microscopy in uh, Imperial. Okay, so let's start. Uh, if you want to go deeper into the theme, obviously there's William Carter, uh, uh, like a series of books. So there will be also Eels and Ten. Uh, but there's also theme specific books. So, like specifically on you can go back to and check for yourself if you want something deeper. So, I will start with STEM and TM. Typically, eels with STEM uh, and FTEM as the next would be used in. So there are a few small differences. So you can use uh, TM. In TM you use, while in STEM you are putting something like a probe, uh, which is and through your sample. While in TM, Stationary. And also, there's a difference in the way you register. So, in TM, you have a set of projection lenses uh, which project the electrons on a screen. In TM, you have a, a set of detectors set at different positions in the column. And they will register electrons at different uh, scattered at different angles. So, what are the incentives to use eels and FTEM? So, usually this method are compared to EDX, and use for the methods are used for elemental mapping. So. Uh, the location of elements. You can uh, you have much better sensitivity in eels. You can reach higher special resolution. And in here you can image all the elements that are in the table, the periodic table. But there are also uh, things that you can get more information from eels than from you would get from EDX, just by the nature of the methods. So you can get information about bonding environment, oxidation state, band gap, uh, the electric function. Also the other important thing is the thickness. So we can measure thickness of the sample somewhat indirectly. Uh, you can also use them by using FTEM. You can use uh, you can use uh, improved contrast in your TM samples. So the phenomenon I was talking about was uh, related to electrons that are transmitted through your samples, and they undergo some inelastic scatter scattering which means they are losing a part of the energy and some of these uh, energy losses are characteristic which means that can be related to a particular element in particular order 
So just to give you a definition, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy is a measure of loss of energy and electron experience when it interacts with a sample. And as you can see here, there are many interactions in which the electrons might be involved. And from each of this inter in each of this interaction, you will be losing a different portion of energy. And then this will be transferred uh, into a spectrum. And to do that, we need uh, some sort of a prism. So in electron microscope, we will be using uh, an electron prism. So the same as with light, we can split our electron beam uh, in a rainbow. And this rainbow depends on the energy of electrons uh, have. So the, <clears throat> so the electrons that are not losing any energy are, are less likely to scatter, uh, while the electrons that lose some energy, they are, become slower and we'll get, uh, we can bend them more. So we get this uh, sort of uh, rainbow and finally we get our spectrum. So there are two types uh, of uh, those uh, electromagnetic prism or all systems, mm, they are uh, called filters. So typically uh, there's a post column filters which is mounted on the uh, end of the microscope column, but sometimes you may also encounter one that are fitted inside the columns. In our microscope at Imperial, you can find this box just underneath the column. So if you uh, look under the desk, you will see something like this. Uh, and this is the device that allows us to do EELS and FTEM. So uh, at Imperial, we have two microscopes that can uh, perform do, uh, these two techniques because they are hybr uh, hybrid uh, TMs, so they can do STEM and TM. Uh, we can switch between those two modes and uh, we can do both EELS and FTEM. So these microscopes are Titan and J2100F. Uh, uh, some of the techniques I will be showing here actually require much better uh, setup. So uh, here I will refer you to go to something like SuperSTEM at Darsbury, where you have a dedicated STEM microscope and they can uh, use, uh, perform EOS with very high resolution. They are dedicated for STEM, so they are not very good uh, in doing FTEM. So here are the two techniques, and this is like the best description that can be given uh, to explain those two techniques. So in STEM EELS, you are doing STEM mapping, so you're moving pixel by pixel, and for each pixel, you are you will be acquiring a whole spectrum. Uh, uh, of energy losses of your electrons. In FTEM mapping, you take your spectrum, you set a window uh, in a given electro uh, energy range, and you take a picture just made out of these uh, filtered out electrons. So this is uh, the yield spectrum in all its glory. So it doesn't look much at the beginning, but we'll go into details and you will see from each part of the spectrum, you will get uh, a different information and depending on study you are doing, you might process them in a different way. So again, uh, these are the energy losses or interactions that may happen uh, in your sample. And we divide those interaction into three regions typically. We have zero loss region, balance region and core loss region. And we'll talk about it uh, one by one. So the zero loss peak is basic, are basically the electrons that are not interacting with your sample. They are just going through. If we look at something like diffraction patterns, this would be the central spot in your diffraction pattern. So the place where electrons not really interact with your sample. But uh, because they are uh, energy spread of resources, your, the, we have, basically we don't have an ideal system in the, uh, in the microscope, there is some sort of thickness to the zero peak. And that thickness is uh, high, high, usually measured by the 
uh, half height wide uh, is the measure of it's defining the energy resolution of our system. Uh, we use this peak to calibrate our system, so we want this peak to be at zero uh, energy loss. And we can use this peak in combination with plasmon peaks to get idea about thickness of our sample. So just a practical note, if you are using the, you are looking at zero peak, be careful because it's a very intense beam and you might damage your detector. So uh, typically we lower the imaging time for, for that peak. As I said, there's a defined white uh, for the peak, which defines our resolution, uh, but we have uh, an instrument, at least on the Titan, which, calls, uh, which is called a monochromator, which is basically a filter which filters out some uh, electrons at different energy uh, when we at the very top of the column, so when the electrons are produced. Uh, so by using the monochromator, we can uh, reduce the weight of the peak. So by this increasing, increasing the resolution of our system. Uh, but we are losing some electrons in the process, so the peaks will be less intense uh, and the intensity of our spectra will be reduced. So we are going now to the more applied uh, experimental things that we can see in our spectra. So we can observe phonons, and this is maybe not looking much when we are uh, looking at, at the spectra itself, uh, but here's something on the left-hand side image that you won't see throughout this presentation. We are recording peak at my, uh, milli electron volts, so very, very small uh, electron losses can be recorded. Uh, and this is reflective of the phonon, so we are recording something like oscillation of the ions of the crystal lattice. So very small vibrations and we can relate those vibrations to optical properties uh, of the microscope, uh, sorry, of the of the sample we are using uh, in experiment. So this type of experiment cannot uh, be really done on the systems that we have at Imperial. You will have to go to something like Super STEM uh, to perform these uh, experiments. But if we move further from the uh, from the zero peak, uh, we have plasmons, which are a collective excitation of valence uh, valence electrons, and Here's something that we can start to record, uh, which, much, which more is, and we're doing it routinely. So and this is uh, typically a region between 1 to 40 electron volts. And, and we have two types of plasmons that can be recorded. So we have a bulk plasmon. Uh, which is the bulk of material, so the oscillation of the bulk of material. And we have surface plasmons, uh, which has less energy, and they can be observed only on the surfaces of the material, so uh, like tens of nanometers away from the, or even tens of nanometers away from the surface. So it's like a, a sort of uh, telegraphic uh, events. So we can, the very nice things about plasmons is that we can use them to estimate thickness of our samples. Uh, so we don't have a direct thickness. To have a direct thickness like expressed in nanometers, we would have to uh, have a better idea of the composition of our sample. But what we can record is T over lambda. So the sample thickness over the free mean paths of uh, electron in a given material. So by to do uh, to get that information, uh, we basically compare uh, the zero loss peak with the first plasmon peak, and from that uh, relation, from this ratio, we can estimate the thickness. So the single scattering uh, events. This this is what we are aiming for. Uh, usually happens when the T over lambda are between 0.3 to 0.5. And this is uh, like the most optimal setup 
thickness for your sample. So even if you are not planning to do a lot of yields or F10, this is a good way to check if the uh, thickness of your sample is good enough for any other experiments. And as you will see in a few moments, the thickness matters here uh, in what information you are getting, whether the information you are getting is real. So this is a bit of an extreme example of what happened when your sample is very thick. You will have a multiple uh, sort of plasma peaks, which will eventually obscure all the useful information you can get from your sample. So what you are aiming for, if uh, your thick thickness of your specimen is right, you will be see seeing only a large uh, zero peak and your first plasma in the spectra. You can remove uh, some of the thickness effects. Maybe not all of them, uh, but there are two methods that we are basically using. So one is uh, designed for low loss spectrum. It is called Fourier lock deconvolution. For that, we need to uh, acquire a single spectrum, which is containing um, the zero loss peak. Uh, and then the procedure is automated in, in the software you use. So you are removing the zero speed and uh, removing the thickness effect. The other one is Fourier uh, ratio deconvolution. This is used when you're looking at some features uh, at the uh, lower energy uh, electrons. So you will need the zero loss uh, peak spectrum and the spectrum you are of the region you are interested in, and you are using those two, uh, two spectrums to deconvolve the data and receive the information of your sample. So here are a few more practical application of uh, plasma peaks. So one obvious thing, you can use it for mapping, so you can look at a specific energy region. Uh, so here you have a, a plasma peak which is between 70 and 21 electron volts. And we can just focus on this uh, on this peak and have a map of our of our specific uh, things in sample. So in that case here we have a nanotubes uh, which have this characteristic plasma peak uh, of 70 to 21 electron volts. We can also look at the surface plasma. So as you can see here, color coded peaks. Uh, so in red, you have this very pronounced A peak uh, and moving to all the way to blue. Uh, you have peaks uh, moving from around uh, two to three electron volts. So very small numbers, but you can see uh, the amount of a given uh, plasmons in different uh, parts of your sample are changing so you can get information about the changes inside your samples how the uh, electrons behave in your samples at, at at different points in your sample so with the electron region you can also measure the band gap so the gap between valence and conduction bands and this is applicable for all sorts of insulators and semiconductors and what you are looking is you are observing the flat region uh, right behind your zero peak, and you're looking for the place where your uh, peaks start to set on. And this is very much dependent on the thickness, as you can see here. So only for a given amount uh, of thickness. So as we were saying before, something up to 0.5, uh, you have a real values here. Then, as you can see, the onset of the peak is changing with the thickness. So the thicker sample is, uh, the less accurate our information about the sample would be. Uh, another thing you can measure in valence loss are inter-intraband transitions. So here you are measuring electrons uh, that uh, transfer sufficient energy to a single valence electron. Uh, to excite it to an occupied state in the conduction band. So again, here we'll be uh, looking at a 
low energy changes, so anything below 10 electron volts. And as you can see here, we can observe a difference uh, in polystyrene just by observing the uh, the change in uh, in the valence lost. So you can see two two materials, two poly uh, poly uh, polymers. Uh, one is polystyrene and polyethylene. You can see the chemical difference in them. Uh, that one has a benzene ring, and this this change is already uh, giving the difference in the signal. Uh, the other more complex thing is we can calculate the electric function uh, of our sample, which can then be related to optical properties. Uh, in doing that, we need our spectrum to be uh, separated into a real and imaginary part. And so we will sort of produce two different, uh, two different um, plots. And from that, we can uh, discern uh, the electric function of our specimen. So as you can see in the valence loss region, there are many information encoded, but also but also you have to have some knowledge about your sample so you don't uh, misinterpret it, uh, uh, your uh, your outcome. Okay, so moving further down uh, the uh, electron, electron loss uh, regions, we are getting to a core loss region. So this is the region that most people use seeing uh, all the time. So here we're looking at the specific uh, elemental edges, uh, which are characteristic to each element. So we can detect uh, specific elements and also we can get uh, information about the bonding environment, the oxidation state, uh, coordination environment and so on. So as you can see here, uh, there's always this jump on the spectra and here we, uh, I have multiplied by 200. Uh, the core loss region, uh, the signal is much, much lower than the zero peak and the plasmon peak. Uh, so you will be looking at a much longer acquisition times than you would be using that uh, for uh, zero loss or, or the valence loss electrons. So what are call loss uh, to be specific? So these are inertial transitions. So uh, electrons, uh, can be excited to a specific energy, which is quantified. And those, uh, ener so that means that energy are uh, almost roughly the same uh, in each event. And we are moving the inertial electrons to uh, unoccupied higher states. So if we cross the uh, energy boundary for a given element, we'll get a peak. Uh, so electrons losing some energy and we are collecting that energy, which is characteristic for uh, a given element. So typically we name uh, those, uh, those peaks by uh, the related edge. So we, uh, so we use the shell, uh, shells naming uh, to describe those edges. So basically, if you if we are talking about uh, a carbon K edge, we are talking about uh, carbon electrons that are coming from one S state uh, in K shell, and so on. So if you are talking about Cl, uh, C, uh, sorry, calcium L edge, for example, then we were we will be talking about the transitions from. Uh, 2s and 2p state and so on and so on. So okay, here we have a very idealized uh, electron edge, uh, energy loss edge. Uh, so basically we have this 
sharp onset, and then we have a decreasing probability of ionization represented by uh, the energy loss. So the higher the uh, the more energy it loss, uh, the electron will loss away from the uh, onset edge. It will be less probable for the electron to go into into that transition. But obviously, we don't have an it, uh, ideal system in uh, in our samples. So we have to add background that's coming from uh, plural scattering. Uh, there is background coming from thickness of our specimen. Uh, there is a combination of plasma losses, ionization, and finally there is uh, there are changes that are reflected by the um, band structure in our samples, so the uh, energy levels in our samples to which the electrons can be excited. And we actually can utilize this knowledge to get information from the sample. Uh, so we divide the uh, electron uh, spectroscopy edge, uh, the core edge in two uh, regions. Why one is illness, so energy loss near edge structure, uh, which is the very beginning uh, of every edge. And from that we can get information about the uh, local density of empty states. And XLFS, which is extended energy uh, loss fine structure. Uh, this is more popular uh, but uh, to explore, but it also con uh, converts some information about the local coordination of the atom uh, and also some diffractive uh, information. So often when you are looking at the sources, uh, there might not be a lot of information about uh, eels specifically, but this is a comparable technique to X-ray spectroscopy. So uh, the information that you would get for something like uh, Zanes or XAPS are comparable to the information that you will get from illness, at least in terms of the spectroscopy. So this is, uh, I think, the most powerful example uh, why we use core loss edges. So we have here four uh, carbon-based materials with a different structure. And as you can see, the difference in the structure is reflected uh, in the shape of the edges. So basically by looking at the individual peaks, how they are shifting, uh, where they are positioned and so on, we can get the knowledge uh, quite in, uh, in depth about how our sample is made, uh, how it's constructed, uh, what are its properties. So here you can observe uh, what is the impact of, uh, of source we are using uh, in our EOS experiment. So on the very top we have a model, calculated one. Uh, just above that we have uh, X-ray absorption edge, so in terms of uh, spectroscopy you can see it's very well defined. And if we look higher, uh, we have three uh, electron microscopy setups. So the blue one, the thermoionic, you can see we are, if we are using this, this type of source, uh, we are losing a lot of information because our electrons coming from the source are not uh, very homogeneous. They have different energies. If you use something like a a uh, cold field emission gun, you can see we are getting more detail, uh, but only if we use a monochromated uh, cold pack, we are getting this very detailed information about our sample. So uh, it really helps what, what the setup we have in uh, our microscope and use of the monochromator is always beneficial to the the amount of information we are able to extract uh, from our sample. And here are more uh, typical applications uh, of coreless edges. So we are doing mapping. This is sort of taken to extreme when we are looking at uh, atomic columns. So you can, as you can see, map almost individual uh, elements where the atoms are placed in the lattice, so we get a chemical map of a 
of a crystal lattice um, of your sample. So as you can see, there are many applications uh, for ES edges. You can extract a lot of information uh, from the sample. Uh, so starting from thickness of your sample uh, to very intricate knowledge about the bonding environment, elemental composition, uh, optical, even optical properties uh, of your sample if your uh, system is good enough. But there are also considerations that you have to take into account. So basically, uh, as I said, when you are using eels, uh, you are using STEM. So all the problems that you or the, or the things that you can take into account doing STEM would be also needed to uh, to be taken into account when you are using STEM eels. So. You have to know what sort of uh, condenser aperture to use, operating voltage, camera length, uh, conver convergence angle, and so on. You will also need to work out what would be the optical collection angle. So the uh, um, this will be governing how much of the electrons are getting uh, into your uh, into the spectrometer. If you put too little, uh, then uh, there will be problem with noise. If you uh, put too many, you will be probably getting, uh, you will be losing some of the information. You might be, uh, uh, you might be oversaturating your detector and so on. Uh, energy resolution. So obviously, this is something that we, I was talking a bit. Uh, so how how good in resolving. Uh, given peaks would be your uh, your setup. Uh, something that I was not talking uh, a lot was energy dispersion. So basically uh, the way that you are collecting your electrons is that you have a detector with a number of channels and you are set them as beans. So you can say the for each channel you will collect uh, two EV uh, range of electrons or maybe 0.5 EV uh, uh, electrons gap and so on and so on. So you will be collecting, so this will govern how much of the spectrum you can get in one acquisition. Obviously, the smaller uh, beams you will set, the more detailed information you will get, but uh, you will be looking at very tiny piece of, piece of a spectrum. So uh, if you are, want to see the changes that are connected, for example, in two elements, which have two slightly different energy uh, energy values of the coage, you may not capture them all if you have uh, too low energy dispersion. Uh, and obviously, uh, with all sorts of experiments, is how much you want to spend time of them. So how long you will acquire will your sample uh, withstand the amount of electrons that you are putting in. Uh, so these are all the things that you need to consider uh, doing eels. So you can also do quantitative eels, which is actually not that trivial, uh, because uh, what you need to do, you need to obviously eliminate of the thickness effect, so subtracting uh, your background, and then you have to uh, fit the model uh, of your edge to what you are actually getting. And the main thing governing the quality of your quantitative yields would be how the how good the model is. So typically uh, you will get those very idealized edges. So as you can see, they are, might not uh, give you a very reliable information, uh, but to some application they are good enough. Uh, if you're wor working with modelers, then maybe provide you uh, better models that would yield uh, better data. Also, the problem with uh, quantitative yields is that you cannot really compare uh, the peaks directly. So here we can see borium nitrate specimen, and we can look at two different peaks, so boron uh, and nitrate. And as you can see, 
the boron peak is much, much uh, more intense than the one of nitrogen, but the composition of the sample is basically one to one. So boron to nitrate is one to one. So this is something that you need to consider. You cannot compare the uh, peaks directly as something you uh, might do with uh, EDX, just looking at the ratio of different peaks and how this ratio changes. Uh, some more practical information, uh, you can have a different analysis mode in EELS, so you can basically take information from your point. Uh, you can raster uh, a line uh, through a specimen, you can get information from that, and then obviously the most popular one is when we doing mapping, so we scanning uh, our probe through a region, and for each pixel we are collecting the spectral information. Uh, one consideration uh, about acquiring spectra is obviously noise. So always you have to question yourself whether the feature you are seeing is real or is it just noise. So for that, on the right hand sp uh, right hand side uh, spectrum, you can see uh, we are collecting a pre-edge. So how the spectrum looks be uh, before the onset of our edge. And we can see it's actually quite noisy. So all those features that we see after our features, uh, after the main feature, uh, we have to question them whether they are real or they are just uh, just noise. Okay, so this was basically what constitutes eels. Now we are moving slightly at them, and you will see this is very similar technique. Uh, the, it's using the same principles. You can use the same uh, energy loss regions to get similar information, uh, but there are some benefits which might, uh, might be more useful. Uh, it might be more useful to use FTEM than STEM and vice versa. So uh, you will have to decide in your own experiments uh, which one to choose. So what we can use uh, the zero, uh, the spectra for, so as discussed, we set a wind energy window over a, a region of interest. So in that case, we are to, uh, making uh, a filter over zero loss uh, peak. And by that, we are removing all the electrons that have a different energy and that might be contributing to uh, to the image. And as you can see, we can by doing that we can collect an image that is much better quality. It's showing more distinct features, has better contrast. So this is like the most straightforward application of FTEM imaging. We are putting a filter window over a peak of interest, and we are collecting an image. Uh, we can use uh, the same applications, uh, FTEM for the same application, so we can measure thickness of our sample. Uh, we can also do plasmon mapping, so taking information from the plasmon just by setting uh, a win energy window on our sample. If we uh, moving to a Carlos region, we have to uh, be a bit more careful, so we have to uh, to look also at the background information, uh, because the background might quite change depending on the thickness uh, of our samples. So we are using uh, a jump ratio imaging. Uh, in that method, you're collecting a pre-edge uh, and your edge of interest. And as the, uh, as the name suggests, you are looking at the ratio of these two uh, to get the information where the elements are. So this is just a simple example. We are looking here uh, at titanium. So we collected pre-edge, uh, the post-edge, and we look at the ratio. So uh, the regions that are brighter contain more, more titanium and the, the ones that, that are darker here. So a very simple, uh, very fast method to acquire chemical map. Obviously, if we want to be uh, 
more accurate, it's better to uh, take more precautions uh, in subtracting the edge. So more accurate with this free window technique. In that technique, we are taking two pre-edge uh, pre uh, windows and one post-edge. And from that, uh, we can reconstruct more accurate background subtracted uh, maps. And obviously, we can move using FTEM, we can move to something more closely resembling uh, ILS methods. So instead of just doing uh, two windows, three windows, we can divide uh, the spectrum of uh, the region of interest in our spectrum in a series of beams and collected electrons for each uh, individual, individual beam and make image of that so we will get a series of images and then we can see how uh, how the elemental composition varies when we're moving from one region to another so here we are observing uh, copper and zinc in an alloy so first uh, when we look at the 950 region we have the onset of uh, of copper and then uh, we have, if we're looking further uh, down the mm -hmm. down the energy losses, we'll see uh, zinc popping out on the sides of this uh, very distinct copper line. Yes. Yeah, so in general, when we're looking at uh, after mapping, it's much faster uh, than doing ILS because in ILS you are scanning your probe. Uh, throughout your images uh, in a raster fashion, so it will take uh, much more time, and by that it's more uh, sus uh, it's more sus uh, it's it can be more affected by any sort of a vibration, or you can apply more damage into your sample uh, if you are doing this scanning routine in STEM. Uh, FTM is basically equivalent on doing TM. Uh, you can image a large region with uh, in a very short time. Uh, the problem might be that you are do, uh, giving a much higher electron dose, uh, but this depends what damage mechanisms are there in, in, in your sample. So quick comparison between uh, FTM and stem eels. Uh, so I already mentioned uh, beam damage. So this really depends on the mechanism uh, uh, in which your sample damage more likely. So in some cases you might observe that in TM conditions uh, your sample is uh, getting destroyed, but in stem it's fine, and vice versa. So this, one, this is one thing that might govern uh, your choice of method. Uh, so the benefits of using TM in general is that it's faster. It's gave you quite a good uh, spatial resolution. You get the map immediately. And if they are shifted because something is drifting, it's much easier to correct uh, in TM mode than in STEM. Uh, in STEM, uh, STEM eels, you will get a much better precision. Uh, you can you have much greater control on your dose. So uh, when you're moving point by point, you get the exact info, hem chemical information from that spot. Uh, uh, so you get a much bigger data set. You have more information uh, for each pixel and you can process it in the way that will resemble the final outcome uh, of Afton. And uh, also the, here is the comparison between ELSE and EDX. Uh, again, there are some differences. So the major benefit of using something like ELSE is that uh, you can detect almost all elements with high precision. So as, is, as you form a small probe, you'll get the exact uh, information for the exact spot. 
uh, which is with EDX it's uh, much harder to obtain because you're just collecting a small fraction of the emitted X-rays, while in uh, EELS you must you will be collecting almost all the electrons that uh, that went of the the characteristic interaction, and obviously you will get much more information in EELS from the spectra uh, you are receiving because you will get the information about the bonding, about the coordination, and so on. In EELS, as you can see on the image, this information is quite obscure. Uh, so this will be the end of the lectures. If you have any question, please uh, let me know.